So, St. Paul talks about us all having one mind. And, you know, initially, my response is, what do you mean, have one mind? I mean, if you think about it, we, as Christians, we tend to see things so differently, don't we? We have so many different aspects, so many different opinions, so many different wants, so many different desires. And yet here's Paul saying we are to have one mind. Well, I want to do a little survey first, just to see if my premise is correct. How many of you enjoy drinking Pepsi? Coke? It's about 50-50. Neither. Yeah, there you go. How many of you like cats? Dogs? Whoa, dogs are dominating in this service. Neither? How many of you like country music? How many like classical music? How many like neither of those two? Yeah. Interesting. How many of you are Republican? Democrat? Independent? I don't care what's going on. <laughs> How many of you were raised Lutheran? Converted? Still thinking what is Lutheran and what is not here? Yeah. How many like hymns? How many like contemporary music? How many like neither? I'm just seeing if there's anybody wondering why you're here. So, how many of you think the King James Version is the only authoritative version of the Bible? How many like contemporary versions of the Bible? How many like whatever Bible's in front of them? Some Christians believe that you need to give a testimony of faith when you're baptized. Other Christians baptize in. Some Christians believe that there are seven sacraments, some two, and some none. Some Christians believe that you have to have bishops in order to have a church. Other Christians do not. Some Christians um, are focused on premillennial dispensationalism. Other Christians don't even know what that means. And we care less. So how can we have one mind when we are all over the place on trivial things practical things, even some theological things. Do we just have a one mind that is just kind of superficial? Where we never disagree on anything, that we're just kind of polite to each other, treat each other with respect, bearing all of our disagreements? You know, I think we need to treat each other with respect, and I don't think Paul is calling for us to bury our disagreements. I don't think that he wants us to be Minnesota nice, which Pastor April told me is a fancy term for passive aggressive behavior. <laughs> is one mind just superficial and shallow? Well, listen to what Paul says in the 27th verse of Philippians. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. So that whether I come and see you, or I'm absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. I would argue that being of one mind doesn't mean that we agree on all these trivial things, but that we agree on the one thing, God. We hear in Romans 14, 1, As for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him, but not to quarrel over opinions. Huh? So if there's somebody weak in the faith, we don't bring them to church to, to win them over to our way of thinking. We are, we are about helping them understand that one thing to help them in their faith relationship with God. Galatians 1, verse 10. For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. Paul says, it's going to shock you, it's impossible to please everyone in church. 
So Paul says, my focus is upon being a servant of Jesus Christ. You know, the association we're part of LCMC, one of the things that I was doing for a while was going around talking with churches because people were having questions about the association and who we are and what we're about. And, and at one, one time, a person stood up and said, well, you've just been talking so glowingly about LCMC. There's got to be some negatives. What are the negatives? And I said, yeah, there are. It's got people in it. Dead serious. It's got people in it. Our personal opinions, and when we hold those up as being the most important thing, is usually when the church gets damaged. It's when we have belief in the one thing, God, when we focus upon Jesus Christ and Him alone, and understand that this is His church, that the church is usually strengthened and able to do amazing things. So, back in 2002, our congregation went through a really difficult time. And during that time, we, we really were in a lot of disagreement. You could literally cut the air with a knife. I mean, it was, it was heavy. And, and as a part of that was, was a challenge for us as a congregation to say, okay, what, what exactly do we believe in? Some of you were members back then. You walked through that. Some of you are new and you're kind of like, oh, I have no idea what this is about. But, but what we did was we put together a task force, and some of you probably didn't know this, put together a task force to say, we want to come up with our core beliefs, what we, what we stand for, what, what we're all about. And, and so we did that, and, and this group started writing these, these building blocks of, of core beliefs, of, of, of how we are in one mind as a congregation. And I think it was funny, as we got about three quarters of the way through, we realized that we really had just been rewriting the Apostles' Creed, that we weren't really creating anything new, we were just kind of rewording something that was time-honored and tested, which was kind of an affirmation to us. So I want to share these with you, and, and with each one, we came up with a, a scripture, not the proof text, you know, not to come up with the opinion and then say, okay, where can we find in the Bible to verify this, but really allow the Bible to speak to us and guide us. So here's what it is. We believe that the Bible is inspired by the Holy Spirit and is the authoritative Word of God in all matters of faith and conduct. So in other words, in essence, we're saying that we believe that the Bible is the authoritative uh, document. It is, it is what guides us as Christians, as individuals, and as a congregation. It's not one source among many. It is the primary source. And everything else uh, is secondary in nature. We hear in, in 2 Timothy 3.16, All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for proof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, that the woman of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. We find our leading, our guidance out of God's Word. We also believe that there is one God eternally existing as the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We believe in the triune God. Even though it's, it's hard for me to understand that intellectually, we believe with every fiber of our being it is true. Jesus in Matthew 28, 19 said, Go, therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in life, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We believe that those three personages coexist as the one Godhead. We also believe that God is the creator of everything, and that God continues to sustain his creation. So as we look at the vastness of the universe, the complexities of the universe, the fine-tuning of the universe, we see the hand uh, uh, that orchestrates all that. As we look at the, the minutia of our own body, right down to our own DNA, and find the blueprint of life, we believe that there is an architect, and we believe that it is God. But God didn't just create and then sit back and, and watch the universe. God is continually uh, in, in the process of providing us for what we need. So as in the Lord's Prayer, we pray, Lord, uh, you know, thank you for my daily bread that you give to me. We see God's divine providence in our lives. Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It's just that simple. We believe in the sanctity of life. We believe that life, my life, your life, are, are precious. They are, they are gifts from God, and, and we should cherish the life that we have. Psalm 139.13, for you form my inmost parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully 
and wonderfully made. We believe that all have sinned against God and are in need of a Savior. Every single one of us has sinned against God. Every single one of us are in need of a Savior. Now this is important because, you know, sometimes we think this cognitively, but we don't allow it to touch us spiritually. You know, uh, cognitively we can believe, yep, Jesus died for everybody's sins and, and he saved the world and, you know, I, I know that, I believe that. But it's something totally different when it touches me intimately, right? I mean, a, a couple weeks ago, for instance, um, my, my wife and I, we went out for Valentine's dinner. We went to Charleston's. By the way, 4.30 is the magic time to go. We walked right in, and it was pretty cool. And then looked at all the people staring at us as we came out. But imagine at the Valentine's table, you know, we have our meal, and we share our Valentine's cards. Imagine if the conversation went like this. What if I said to my wife, Sherry, I love you. But of course, I love everyone. I think Valentine's would have taken a nosedive right then and there, right? Why? Because the general just is kind of meaningless. What does she want to hear? She wants to hear that I love her intensely. The same thing is true of the cross. We may say, yeah, Jesus died for my sins, but imagine moving that to the intimate where you understand, where you grasp a hold of, where you hang on to the fact that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins, for my sins. My sins were bad enough. My nature was so corrupt that I put the Son of God on the cross. Suddenly, everything became very important. And I can no longer just live my life the same. It propels me and challenges me and forces me to be convicted of my sins, to repent of them, and changes me as a person. We believe in John 1, chapter 1, verse 8. If we say we have no sin, right, we deceive who? Ourselves, right? And the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and He is just to forgive us all of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we've not sinned, it goes on. We make God out to be a liar. And His word is not in us. So if any of us gathered here today thinks that we're perfect, God's word is not playing a, a role in your life. We believe Jesus Christ, conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of a virgin, is our Savior. Luke 1, 39, the angel said to her, the, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, the power of the Most High will overshadow you, therefore the child will be born, will be called Holy, the Son of God. We believe that we are in a sinful condition, we are in need of a Savior, and we believe that Jesus Christ is that Savior. The one who saves us, restores us, forgives us, redeems us, gives us the power to enter an intimate relationship with God. We believe that Jesus Christ lived a sinless life and that he died on the cross for our sins. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, for our sake, God made him to be sin, Jesus, who knew no sin, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Not by our actions, not by our good works, not by being great people, but by simply believing and trusting in what Jesus Christ did for us. We believe Jesus Christ was raised from the dead, and it, see how this is sounding like the Apostles' Creed? We believe that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead and ascended into heaven. The act of salvation happened when Jesus died on the cross. But Jesus rose from the dead as he said he would, as he promised he would, as he prophesied that he would. And he stepped forth out of that tomb alive to give us the verification that his promises could be trusted. That what he did on the cross is true. And that his promise for us, for eternal life, restoration with God for all of eternity, is something that we can have confidence. Jesus Christ stepped out from the tomb. We hear it in Luke chapter 24 of the women who were frightened, bowing their faces to the ground. The men, the angels said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He's not here. He's risen. 
Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful man, crucified, and on the third day rise? And they remembered his words. And they returned from the tomb and they told all these things to the eleven and all the rest. We believe Jesus Christ will return in power to judge the living and the dead. Jesus Christ will come again. We don't know when, we don't know where, we don't know how. But we know that he will return. And we are called as God's people to wait, to watch, to be prepared, to be living our lives as repentant sinners seeking to live his righteousness in this world. To make a difference. 1 Thessalonians 4. The Lord himself will descend from heaven with the cry of command, the voice of the archangel, and the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead will rise first. We believe Jesus Christ promises eternal life to all who trust and believe in him. Romans 10. Because if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord, if you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there's no distinction between Jew or Greek. Did you hear this? There is no distinction between Jew or Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all. You don't get any clearer distinction, any more division than between the Jew and the non-Jew. But there is no distinction because there is one Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call upon him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. It doesn't matter if you're Democrat, Republican, or Independent. We have the same Lord over all. We believe that God the Holy Spirit gives us as believers daily guidance, convicts us of our sins, intercedes in our prayers, enables us to live godly lives in our personal walk, in our marriage, our family, and in our community relationships. The Holy Spirit is here to help us, to counsel us, to empower us, to inspire us, to gather us, to call us to be followers of Jesus Christ. And through that, the Holy Spirit does some incredible things. Now, people talk about spiritual gifts and all that, and I think spiritual gifts are great. But you know what? I, I could really care less about spiritual gifts in, in light and in contrast to something else. And that is the fruit of the Spirit. You can do all kinds of stuff, but if it does not produce the fruit of the Spirit, then you're just spinning your wheels. You're not being the church. Because here is the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against these things, there's no law. Paul says there's nothing illegal about any of these things. These are what builds up the body of Christ. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with all of its passion, with all of its desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited in provoking one another or envying one another. We believe that the power of the Holy Spirit strengthens the church and brings us into unity. We believe in the sacraments. We believe in the sacrament of baptism we're tied to the death and resurrection of Christ. When we gather for communion, we believe that it is his body, his blood, given and shed for us. We believe that we are tied intimately to the, to the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that brings us unity. Now, it's so easy for us to focus on our differences, isn't it? And that's what the world does. The world does that. The world is crazy nuts right now lifting up all of our differences. And if we buy into that as people of God in church, we're going to be blown apart. And I want to bear my soul here a little bit. And some of you may know what I'm talking about, others may have no idea, that's okay. But I personally feel like Satan has been nipping at the heels of our congregation for the last couple of years. And I'm sick and tired of it. I want Satan banned from this congregation. And I want Jesus to just take him and kick him right out the door because all we've been doing is focusing upon all of our differences. And it's ridiculous. Our focus should not be upon ourselves, should not be upon each other. Our focus should be upon Jesus Christ. It is His church. It is His church. 
And we are called to follow Him. The authority of God's Word, the presence of the Holy Spirit, and the promise of God comes to us through Jesus Christ, and it is that that binds us together as His people, the church. And it is that which will inspire us to be His people, the church, not only here, but out in the world. Now, during Lent, we're going to spend 40 days of inspiration together. And if you haven't jumped on board yet, I encourage you to consider doing that. Whether it's in a small group, whether it's in a study group, whether it's uh, in your own personal devotion time, whether it's just praying for the congregation as we go through this, I pray that you consider this because this is a moment when, when we're going to spend time intimately fixing our eyes upon Jesus and asking for God to challenge us to get outside of ourselves, to, to outlive our life, and, and to be followers of Jesus Christ. I pray that through this time of focusing upon Christ, this time of asking for God's Spirit to rain down upon us, that we would grow in His Word, that we would respond to His love as disciples with one mind focused upon Jesus Christ. Not distracted by all the stuff but focus upon Jesus Christ. With one mind, one Lord, one Spirit, one Word, one grace, inspiring us to be His disciples. In the name of Christ our Lord and Savior.